On behalf of Halter, on behalf of Halter Ferguson Financial, we welcome you to tonight's event. What you may not know about your investments, a conversation with Bradford Ferguson and Tony Hutton. As a reminder, our client-centric mission is we help proactive savers who value fiduciary guidance commit to a strong financial future. We help them clarify their financial priorities and lifetime money goals and strive to help them stop worrying about money and enjoy their lives. We will know we are successful when we help our clients to dream again through deeply personal finances. We recognize a way in achieving this mission is through communication and education. So for this first webinar of its kind, we have gathered the most common questions HFF employees receive from clients. Along with these questions, Bradford and Tony will discuss efficient market theory and one of the newest investments, air test systems. Please submit your questions in the chat room or the Q&A section of the webinar and we'll do our best to get to them at the end of the webinar. If for some reason we can't answer your question, uh, we'll make sure and follow up. Um, this session is being recorded and it will be sent out to clients in the coming days. We have a full agenda, so go, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so let's just start at the beginning. Bradford, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, what are they and why do we invest and when? Okay, so a stock gives us the um, a piece of ownership of a company, whether it's public or private. Public means it trades on a stock exchange somewhere and a place, the price fluctuates throughout the day. Private companies, the value still fluctuates, um, but there's nobody saying that. Um, so it gives you ownership of the future earnings of the company and a claim on the assets of a business. Um, bonds are loans to corporations, municipalities, or governments, and to owners of real estate. A real estate bond is called a mortgage. Um, bonds don't give you the upside or the earnings of the entity that you're loaning to. So if you're loaning to a company, uh, you don't have any kind of claim on their earnings. You just get some kind of interest rate from them. And what we know is that the billionaires, um, they got that way by owning businesses. Warren Buffett owns an insurance company. He doesn't loan his money to an insurance company. Um, mutual funds are a way to uh, combine assets. You can diversify through owning many stocks. Some mutual funds may own only stocks or only bonds, and some may own a mixture of them. Um, the reason why that we own stocks is for long-term growth to fulfill your financial goals. And what bonds give us is they give us something that tends to be stable uh, when the market's down, and it gives us something to um, bounce off of when when markets are volatile so when stocks are way up we'll trim back on stocks we'll put some of that money uh, into bonds um, and we do the opposite when stocks are down if they're down enough we'll we'll buy some stocks and sell some bonds um, so that's some of the basics great thank you tony is there anything you need to add to that uh Sure. One, one sort of thing that Bradford alluded to um, is that stocks and bonds tend to be negatively correlated. You know, fancy term for saying, you know, over the course of time, this might not happen every day, but over the course of time, when stocks go up, bonds tend to go down and vice versa. Uh, commonly her term, if you watch CNBC or another, is flight to safety. Well, when they say flight to safety, what they mean is the stock market's going down, probably a lot, and mm -hmm. people then come in and buy bonds. So bonds tend to go up in value. Again, negatively correlated, they tend to be. Okay, great. All right, Tony, this next question is for you. What changes do you expect in the portfolio? Sure. So 
uh, besides recent purchases we made, and Bradford will go in more detail on air to test systems, mm -hmm. you know, we're constantly looking all the time for any individual stocks that we think are undervalued, right? So that's, that's a day-to-day a -day thing that Bradford and I had commit at least part of our days to. Um, but sort of maybe not as sexy, if, if you'll allow me, is something that uh, you may hear oftentimes out of our industry also, which is known as rebalancing. Um, maybe if I provide a, a quick kind of a hypothetical example um, would be, let's say you've gone through your financial plan with Tiffany and Ben, and we know that if we allocate your portfolio 50% to stocks for that growth, over the long term that Bradford mentioned, and then 50% into bonds, that over the long term, the average return that we'll receive will support all your financial goals. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 50% in stock, 50% in bonds, hypothetical. Now, let's say you bring that money to me tomorrow, and I put it 50% into stocks, 50% into bonds. And then lo and behold, we regain a new bull market, something everybody here is waiting for, especially people at Halter Ferguson. Mm -hmm. um, but the bull market comes, it goes charging, say, for a couple of quarters, so six months down the line. Well, back to that negative correlation idea, perhaps the stocks now represent 55% the value of your portfolio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And we targeted and we put it at 50 to begin with. Therefore, the bonds are only 45 percent. So a typical rebalancing set of trades would mean that the software is monitoring this for me daily. Mm -hmm. It would recommend, hey, you better sell 5 percent in stocks by which you're over the target of 50 percent. Implicit in that means you must be selling at a gain. Right, we started at 50, now it's 55%. We turn around with the proceeds from that 5%, which we sold of stocks, and we purchase bonds with it. And implicit in that means bonds must be performing relatively poorly. So you mm -hmm. can see a rebalancing uh, set of trades enforces a buy low, sell high discipline. So if occasionally you see trades in your account, probably not eliminating completely any one mutual fund or stock, most likely what's happened is there was an opportunity to rebalance, harvest gains in one asset class like stocks, mm -hmm. turn around and buy bonds with it. Common thing you'll see and changes you should expect to see over the course of time. I appreciate what that. I'll add, what I'll add here is, um, you know, if you see sometimes where your portfolio doesn't change much. It just means that those changes aren't being triggered. It's not getting far enough out of balance um, for us to make those changes. That's really good information. I, I hear about rebalancing in our huddles and um, I never know exactly what you're talking about. And now I do, so thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Awesome. So then how will my portfolio be protected against the rising interest rates? That's been a hot question, obviously, this year, especially. I'll, that goes to you, Tony. Yeah, yeah, I'll take a first stab at that. Um, so even though it doesn't feel like it since, say, last November, the primary way to actually protect against rising interest rates is through stock ownership. And the reason it doesn't feel that way since last November is the amount of change going on in our economic system right now is, is a lot. It's a real lot with the increase in inflation and then the subsequent increase in interest rates. However, eventually there'll be a nice new equilibrium set. Okay. And why are stocks a good reason or a good way to protect against inflation. Again, oversimplified example, but I believe it illustrates the point. If I'm a well-run company and I sell toothpaste, like say a Procter & Gamble, mm -hmm. the cost to, for me to make that toothpaste, the input costs have gone up. 
-hmm. Well, I'm a well-run company. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to extend that increase in cost to the consumer, to the people who buy my toothpaste. Now, if I'm a very well-run company and I can get away with it, I'm going to increase the amount that I sell that toothpaste at, at even a greater amount, by a greater amount than the cost mm -hmm. of the inputs. And in turn, I'd increase my profit margins. Um, so mainly it is through stock ownership. Again, I know it doesn't feel like that now. We need for these sort of interest rate changes to wend their way through the system. And that will happen. Um, but it's predominantly through stock ownership and even, you know, different stock sets of stocks will perform better than others during various mm -hmm. times. Um, and specifically, those are known as value stocks. Um, we, we've added value stocks in the last six months to mm -hmm. the portfolios. Okay. I, I hope that helps. Uh, Bradford, do you want to add anything? You're the other thing that. the toothpaste maker might do is they may shrink the size of the tube of the toothpaste. <laughs> yeah, that's true yeah, too. So, yeah. So we all notice that from time to time too. Yeah. I've noticed that with several products after I grocery <laughs> shop. <laughs> uh -huh. okay, all right. Big words here. Efficient market theory. Oh my. Yes. <laughs> So and as you see, we've market. selected a library and a, a, a college student. So educate us here. All Tell right. Me, yeah. What perfect, is it? Perfect uh, picture to show. <laughs> so the efficient market theory, it's, it's a theory um, that can be coupled or is coupled together with a bunch of other theories and principles that over the last roughly 40 years or so, um, it all culminates into something called modern portfolio theory and, and that rebalancing idea that I explained a few minutes ago, it, you know, comes from the set of principles. Specifically, the efficient market theory, I'll, you're okay, I'll use EMT for short because it can be a mouthful. The EMT basically describes how information gets reflected in security prices new information or news. Um, it's sort of dear to my heart because I have a, a relative who formulated the theory and proved it over the course of 35 years mm -hmm. at, a, at a rather prestigious graduate school of business. In any event, what the theory states is that new information, news, gets reflected in stock prices very quickly and without bias. Now, when I use the word bias, that, that's in the mathematical sense, which is just to say that, um, you know, you can, you know, if you model uh, security, you can come up with an expected return. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, anything that doesn't meet within the range of expected returns would be having bias. Mm -hmm. so, so new information, news gets reflected in stock prices quickly and without bias in the mathematical sense. I have had the opportunity to study this ad nauseum, um, but why is it important? Well, and why is it specifically important to Halter Ferguson and Halter Ferguson clients? Yep. So really it breaks down to this. What they did in proving, the academics proved this theory over the course of probably 35 or 40 years, it split the market into two different ways of managing assets, two primary different ways of managing assets. One is called active management. Mm -hmm. The other is called passive management. So we have active, we have passive. Mm -hmm. Active is where a portfolio manager will select from a universe of stocks, say the S&P 500, the 500 largest capitalization stocks in the United States, and, and his assertion is, you know, on these 500 stocks, if I pick 20 to 70 of them, that I'll outperform the index of the 500. Mm -hmm. Now, he tends to charge a hefty fee to do that. And what the academics showed is that that can be accomplished 
it generally isn't accomplished long term though. Uh, they tend to outperform for maybe a five year period, some 10 years, but once you get to 15 years and up, rarely do they outperform. The index, that's active management. Passive management, I would imagine some of our clients have heard of ETFs or exchange traded funds, is where instead of having an active manager that you're paying to pick stocks out of that universe, they just say, hey, instead of that, why don't we have a computer at very, very low cost, simply track those 500 stocks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the world has been split into active and passive management. In fact, about four months ago, the number of assets being managed passively surpassed the number of assets being managed actively. Oh, wow. Now, now that's where it becomes a big deal for Halter Ferguson clients. Um, because those ETFs, those passive investments that are simply tracking the S&P 500 or whatever universe of stocks they're tracking, they don't care about price whatsoever. They, mm -hmm. just, they, they just say track the index no matter what happens. Whereas active managers care about the value of each stock. You know, they mm -hmm. decide to buy it or sell it based on those future earnings that Bradford mentioned. Mm -hmm. And they care about price. So at the end of the day, what this means now that passive has become such a large percentage of the assets under management, that there's significantly more opportunity for active managers to go in and, and, and see stocks that were unduly beaten down because everybody flipped out over inflation or, or some other reason, but they didn't care about price. Um, and, and Bradford and I believe and are quite confident that that gives us additional opportunities um, the, the mere fact that well over half the market isn't paying attention to the price of every security that they're buying and selling. Yeah. And I believe that was the, why the, the third, why the third question was, you kind of just answered it. Yeah. Am I correct? Yeah. So, yeah, so, sorry, so, man, so yeah. no, that's okay. That's all right. We, Let me tack something on here is that, sure. um, so literally half of the assets that are in funds. So, half the assets are in these index funds. So when people panic like they they did today, and when people panic like they did in June, and then earlier this month, these index funds sell every stock in the index, no matter what, because people are remembering that they have this index fund. They see that the market's down. They log on to their Vanguard account or whatever it is, and mm -hmm. they sell they sell their stocks because they're uh, anxious or they're impatient. Even and if an individual stock is known to be doing well, they still just sell it off of just what the market is doing is what you're saying. They have no choice because it's wrapped into the ETF. And just for a, a small point of clarification, Bradford mentioned an index fund. An index fund, is, he's, he's saying the same thing as an ETF or a passively managed investment. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Thank you for that. Okay. Investment decisions. We're moving on to, these are questions for you, Bradford. Obviously, Tony, uh, please chime in as this is a conversation. So how does air test systems take advantage of the popularity of index investing? Yeah. So in, in June, this is a company that Tony had been following for a while. And in June, um, it's a small growth company and actually started off as a micro cap stock when we started buying it. And uh, it's grown since we bought it. Now it's a small cap company. And a micro cap stock is considered a company that is $250 million or less in total market value. That, that's the total value of the company. That's a lot of money, but that's considered micro yeah. <laughs> in, in the public stock markets. Um, and what people did because interest rates have gone up and inflation has gone up is they punished 
small and micro cap growth companies and Airtest Systems was held in some of these ETFs or index funds. Um, but what happened is, and people didn't know, is that Airtest Systems turned profitable and uh, had grown quite a bit year over year and um, was on track to grow further. And uh, we were able to uh, see this opportunity um, to buy it before they had their earnings announcement and um, it's done quite well for us. Um, again, past performance is no indication of future returns. Um, Air Test Systems actually had a good day today because they had a, a really good news. Um, what we highlighted in, in our detailed report on the website, we did, we did have a shorter email, but it linked to a longer report is that Air Test Systems has one big customer and they just announced that a second large customer is starting to buy from them. Um, so people saw that news and um, it was up strongly today despite um, the selling that was happening in index funds because people are going to the stock and buying the stock on, on a day like today. Right. One other thing to sort of maybe tie something together for folks is probably the reason all these small growth, that was a classification Brad for just mentioned a minute or two ago, probably one of the main reasons investors were sm selling small growth like crazy over the, you know, definitely in June and since the inflation numbers picked up is back to the uh, Procter Gamble example, it's generally true and, and understood that if you're a smaller company, you don't have nearly the pricing power you do if you're Procter and Gamble, right? Mm -hmm. So if the cost of my inputs go up in Procter and Gamble, I gave you an example of how, and they can certainly get away with raising prices because they're so big and such a big mm -hmm. portion of the market. Well, it's just generally assumed with small growth companies that they don't have nearly that pricing power. So, you know, it's in an index, the half panicked investor gets on, he knows inflation is picking up and he's got this ETF, exchange traded fund, passively managed and it's chock full of small growth companies. Mm -hmm. So he figures I got to sell that thing, right? And he doesn't care about price of air test systems. And enough people did that. And, you know, again, we believe that opened the door. It was an opportunity for those who do care about what they're paying for an investment. Now, just to clarify, though, we do own some index funds, though, within the HFF portfolio. Is that correct? Yep. We own some index funds. Yep. And they provide, a, I would say, a core for the portfolio and uh, something to balance off of. And then we are opportunistic around that. And the opportunistic is really the active management that you and Tony are doing. Yeah, the active managers and some of the stocks we pick. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, you've got this question a lot, but it has to be asked. Bradford, what investment are you buying next? <laughs> yeah, uh, people are always wondering what's next. And uh, sometimes people, um, part of the reason they'll meet with us is that they think a meeting with us will trigger us to perform some kind of review on their portfolio. And um, Tony and I, we have a system in place to take care of uh, monitoring your portfolios and making sure uh, we're investing the way that we should be for your risk tolerance and your situation. Um, so generally, uh, you know, meeting with me isn't going to trigger something new. And uh, sometimes people will have a chunk of cash and they'll say, hey, Bradford, I got $50,000 uh, from a sale of a car or something. Uh, I want you to put it to work. And, and people are wanting like my juiciest idea. Um, mm -hmm. And generally we believe in um, our whole portfolio. And you know, while it can be fun to like try and goose the portfolio, um, generally we're going to spread the money around when we get some new money. Um, we can't always talk about what we're doing next. Um, for example, for air test systems, it, it's a small company and us, us buying uh, shares of the company actually 
push the stock price up a little bit. Um, so our, combined, our clients own uh, over 1% of the company. Um, and, uh, you know, our buying moved the stock a little bit. And, and we can't tell clients that we're doing that because then people could front run or purchase the stock in front of us. Um, so that that's answers that question. Understood. No juicy <laughs> insider news, guys. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. And, and Just kidding. sort of to uh, tag along on that a little bit, back to air test systems, Bradford had mentioned it was a micro cap. So under 250 million, I mean, it was a small company. And, you know, Bradford did the bulk of this, but he um, purposefully and intentionally took a good, I would say it was maybe even over a week to purchase the shares for all of our clients. And, and at first I was skeptical because these markets tend to be really, really liquid. I thought, in the back of my mind, I was like, I didn't tell this to you, Bradford, at the time, but <laughs> I was like, man, I bet they can do that in a day. No big deal. You won't move the price. Well, probably 20 minutes into him doing it, you, we could see the price moving. So he did an exceptional job and, and had great foresight to be able to see that, yes, it was such a small market capitalization company that it was necessary for us to spread across for about a full week the buys on behalf of the clients. Otherwise, I think we were purchasing it, you know, I don't remember the exact price, but we were moving the price for certain. Interesting. I didn't this, is, this is bringing up a point for me is, I think sometimes people want our, our newest ideas because maybe they might share them with a family member or they might have like some small account they haven't told us about. And then they uh, put all that money in a small, in that small account in that investment. And I don't think that's the best idea. We, we want to help you manage your investment risk in um, there is a uh, risk in air test systems. It's done quite well for us, but uh, they are a small company. They have their own risks in their business. And that's why we kept the investment between one and 2% for most of our clients. So um, let us manage that risk for you. Understood, understood. So how do you find or narrow down which mutual funds to invest in then? This is uh, for Bradford. Okay. So um, I, I've worked with this website called uh, Mutual Fund Observer. And what they're able to do is um, help me define um, some, some metrics to narrow down the mutual fund universe. And what I screen for is consistency of the outperformance of the manager. So the manager might be investing in an area um, mid cap growth, like uh, Clearbridge Select, and um, they are consistent in their outperformance, at least historically. Um, so we're screening for that, and that's year in and year out um, consistency. And uh, we have a measure of consistency that I've I've not seen anywhere else where we we uh, call it a if a um, if a fund outperforms by a certain amount, we call that a win. If they underperform by a certain amount, we call that a loss. And if it's in between, we call that a draw. Um, nobody else seems to be using that. The other thing that we look at is how volatile the fund is. So how much it's moving up and down, uh, how, you know, how wild the ride is to get that performance. Mm -hmm. And the last thing we look at is the expense ratio. So when we, when we combine all those things together, um, we actually named it the Ferguson Mega Ratio. Mm -hmm. And Amory, be happy to follow up with anyone who wants to see this article. Did I freeze? Nope. Okay. Um, and uh, that helps us narrow down the universe of mutual funds from something like 13,000 funds down to like 130. Um, and just allows us to focus on things. And th then what we do is we read what the manager says, the commentary, we look at the portfolio, that kind of thing. Um, 
So that's that's how we narrow it down and find. And then a big hurdle for us to use a mutual fund is, um, is it doing something different than what we're using now? And are they doing it better? Yep. And I will uh, provide my email address at the end of this presentation for anybody who's interested in um, having that article forwarded to them. And just I'll throw in my two cents in that it's also important to emphasize because these are those active managers, right? And I had mentioned in the part about the efficient market theory that active managers are more costly. You know, you have to pay for them versus mm -hmm. an ETF where the computers is tracking it and it's very, very low cost. Um, but to Bradford's credit and the way he set up those metrics, and he, and he, he mentioned this, but I, I feel it's important to emphasize that you know it takes into account the additional fee, right? So so that's already being accounted for. In other words, in our in our measurements, um, mm -hmm. the fee has been withdrawn, right? As as what would have otherwise been you know your return, it was it went to the manager. But again, Bradford's Bradford's uh, what are they the, the mega Ferguson ratios um, <laughs> account for that? Yep. And it's, it's no guarantee that they'll continue to outperform or continue to be consistent, but it just helps us have some confidence that, you know, they're doing something good here and that they'll offer some performance that's a little different than the indexes. So this is another mutual fund question. Are there any common traits shared by the mutual funds that you use? Uh, Tony can right. go ahead and take this one. Oh, okay, Tony. <laughs> Uh, well, sure, in that um, I'm, I'm trying to think of a way not to get, get too esoteric on folks. Bradford mentioned it a couple of times or alluded to it. Are, are they doing something different, right? That's, that's really important because when you're building a portfolio, Bradford also mentioned this too, we care about the entire portfolio and we mm -hmm. care about how much risk you're taking on as an investor. Mm -hmm. So sure, they share common traits and that they tend to look, you know, some are stocks, some are bonds, and, and many of the stock ones are looking for growth, right? Because we know ownership is what's going to build your wealth over time. At the same time, if they're all the same, and they're holding many of the same stocks, there isn't terribly much value, right? Mm -hmm. To adding one that's holding, you know, in great part, the same stocks. Mm -hmm. So a big part of building a portfolio is making sure that, you know, hopefully while some are going up, others are, believe it or not, if you actually want this. I know it sounds completely counterintuitive, but some aren't going up at the same rate. Mm -hmm. right? so, so they might be actually going down on a day when others are going up. Now, long term, we expect them all to go up. Mm -hmm. But that, that's this idea of putting together what we call lowly correlated or and or negatively correlated investments. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it harkens back to that whole thing that anybody like less than number one in investing is diversification. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. All right. So this is on to uh, our, I think it is our last slide. So these are kind of uh, a few different topics that are in these questions. So um, one general question, our, our financial planning team gets this question a lot. How many years cash should I have held in my investments? Um, and I actually have this as Tony to answer this one. And, and this is mainly for clients who need um, money taken out uh, to live off of, like if they're retired or have some kind of ongoing expense. Yeah, right. Go ahead, Tony. So retirement, regularly scheduled withdrawals, living expenses, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, the sooner we know about it, it any uh, withdrawal from a portfolio is better. Mm -hmm. We generally will hold 12 months of cash of what we know you're going to need and you know from your portfolio in, in the next year we want that in cash 12 months now we will let it drift lower to maybe six months 
Mm -hmm. There's a general rule of thumb in the industry. If you invest your money, right, we could get caught in, in an, an entirely unexpected bear market. The perfect, for instance, of late would have been the COVID uh, bear market we suffered starting March 2020. Nobody really knew that was coming. Right. No, nobody at all. Um, so imagine that you're, you know, 75 years old, retired, and we didn't have any cash stocked up for you. And we know you need the cash to live off of. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, we're going to hold at least 12 months. It, now, now, again, we'll let it drift, but no lower than six months. And then we'll look to replenish. So this is just a good reminder again, then, you know, we want our clients to communicate with us. We want to know what's happening in your life. Because um, it does directly relate to how your investment strategy is for each client. So uh, anybody who's listening, if you have anything big coming up, please give us a call. Let us know, right? Absolutely. Communication's key. Communication's but key. what I'll share is our, our system is disciplined. And naturally, what happens is when the market's down um, and we're raising some cash to top it up to back to a year's worth of cash, it's going to tend to sell more bonds to raise that cash. When the market's okay. doing well, it's going to tend to trim more from the stock side. Okay. So our stock picks uh, seem to be in the same industry. Um, why do we plan to branch out into other industries? Bradford, that question's for you. Yeah. So our, our stock picks are in technology um, but I, I think uh, each company is a little different. Um, Tony and I have an eye for technology and generally technology is changing our lives. It's uh, disrupting old industries, disrupting old ways of doing business, innovating. Um, so we've seen uh, Tesla, you know, they're, they're changing the cars that are on the road and they're changing mm -hmm. to electric vehicles. Um, so Tesla makes cars, they make solar panels and stationary storage. Uh, they're trying to make those cars be autonomous so they drive um, without a human needed, um, which may change the taxi industry and may affect Uber and Lyft. Um, one of Tony's favorite investments is NVIDIA. They, uh, they make the intellectual property to make uh, graphics cards and AI chips that are uh, fueling all, all the changes in AI. A lot of shopping, social media is driven by AI, but also business and medical research. Um, mm -hmm. Then air test systems, they uh, make equipment that helps um, silicon carbide chip makers more efficiently um, do business. And then, then we most recently added a company called On Semiconductors, and they're the ones who actually make the silicon carbide chips that go into the electric vehicles. But they also make other chips that go into uh, consumer electronics, that kind of thing. Um, so it seems like they're similar in, in tech, um, and sometimes one investment can lead to another through our research. Um, mm -hmm but they are different companies and uh, we do believe uh, we're diversified that way. And we're gonna continue to look for opportunities and it's mainly gonna be in technology or companies that are changing things. Um, when funding our clients' financial goals, we primarily need your money to grow. We need it to grow to fund your spending, which is your financial goals. Uh, we need to cover taxes if we can, through, through growth. And um, the other piece is um, inflation. Uh, we need your money to grow with inflation so that um, as you need to spend more money as the years go on to buy the same, um, the same good thing to maintain your lifestyle, that it, your money's growing. So growth is important for us. Great answer. So that kind of goes into looking into, you know, new companies. Clients um, sometimes pass along stock companies that they're interested in or curious about. 
how is that best handled? How should they um, come forward with those interests and what are your guys' responses to that? Uh, Tony, I'm gonna direct this that's to you first. Yeah, uh, very straightforward. We welcome them, right? We, we, one of the, there's a couple of key elements, I think, to being able to do the, the work that Bradford and I do to do it successfully. Number one, you, you need to be optimistic, right? We're investing for the future. Um, number two, though, I think it's super, super important to be open-minded. And, and to that end, you know, each and every client out there is going to have different ideas and different perspective. To, and if you want to, as our client, to bring those ideas, absolutely. We're going to be open-minded. We're going to work to, even though it's impossible to remove every bias as a human, we all have our innate biases. Um, to the extent that it is possible, we work to be as unbiased as possible. Okay. okay. So, yeah, we welcome them. Um, and I would, you know, it could be for an industry, say, I might not like for ethical or philosophical reasons. Mm -hmm. I'm still going to be open minded and take a look at it, try to discern whether or not I, we, you know, there's a reason to believe it's undervalued. Um, so yes, please bring them. All right. Wonderful. Wonderful. So that concludes our general questions that are our most popular um, that we've received from HFF clients. Um, as, as Bradford mentioned, um, if you're interested in one of the, uh, the air test system article or the Ferguson metric article, or if you want to submit a question that you didn't want to submit in the chat room, um, feel free to send them to me. Um, and so let's go ahead and move over to the chat room in the Q&A and see if there's any questions that popped up during this presentation. Yeah, I've, I've lost a lot of weight since that picture, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, I do want to share my thoughts around shorter term. Uh, sometimes people ask us what we think the market's going to do over the next uh, six months or a year, that kind of thing. Um, unfortunately, we don't own a crystal ball. We're not going to try and predict that kind of thing. Um, generally, we're fairly positive. I feel I feel the um, developments in Ukraine are positive um, for not just for Ukraine, but for Europe as well. Um, Ukraine is uh, making some significant advances militarily against Russia. Um, it appears that Europe is uh, working to solve their um, energy issue where Russia is refusing to, to sell them uh, natural gas and, you know, threatening them with a the Europeans with a brutal winter. Um, what we've seen is data where there's these huge natural gas tankers and they have these enormous domes on them uh, where they keep the pressurized liquefied natural gas and 82 of these enormous tankers are on their way from various parts of the world to Europe. Um, so as the, the graphic that I saw showed is that the, the Calvary is coming. Mm -hmm. um, my glasses are glaring a little bit. Um, generally, also, we're seeing that prices are coming down as far as inflation, but we, the market did not get the inflation number that it wanted to see today. Um, mm -hmm. What the market was wanting to see is a, a minus sign <laughs> in, in front of the monthly change number. And it was just instead of a minus 0.1% or more, it was a plus 0.1%. Um, so so um, it's worth it to yeah. wait and hear that the year over year, right? The inflation rate is still trending. I, I guess we have two data points right now. So mm -hmm. maybe not formally a trend until we get our third, but the last two months on the year over year basis, it is coming down. That's good. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we're waiting to see price declines that we're hearing anecdotally. We're waiting to see those show through um, to the inflation numbers that the Fed is seeing. Uh, we're um, hearing about real estate price declines. Um, people we know in real estate in Indiana, uh, residential side, they've seen a, a change in activity. Commodity prices have come down. 
used car prices have come down. Um, it's just not showing through yet. And the reason why I think this is good news that market hasn't really seen or realized yet is um, this would cause the, the Federal Reserve to eventually stop or, or slow down on what it's doing to, to fight inflation. Um, market was down a lot today because of that news, um, but it's basically back to where we were last Tuesday, so seven days ago. <laughs> Prior to today, the market had just kind of marched up um, you know, close to like four or five percent um, yeah. across the board, and uh, basically gave that gave that back today. And these things are going to happen. Um, going back to Tony's efficient market uh, theory, uh, when the market gets new news, it's it's quick to make adjustments in general. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it can happen on the way up too, right? It will yeah. happen on the way up. So I'm not seeing any uh, chats or Q and A's, but again, if anyone wants to submit this afterwards, we're happy to answer those questions. But uh, thank you, Bradford and Tony, for your education on the several subjects that we covered tonight. Um, we have again recorded this webinar and plan to send it out within the next few days uh, to all clients um, and to everyone who's attended tonight's event. Thank you again uh, for allowing Holter Ferguson uh, to serve you. And we look forward to continue to serving you for many years to come. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yep. Talk with you soon.